Well, it's good to see y'all this evening. I'm glad that you was able to be here this evening and a little bit chilly outside, but uh, nice and warm in here. How many of you think it's too warm in here? There's a few that thinks it's too warm in here. How many of you thinks it's uh, too cold in here? Nobody tonight? Well, how many thinks it's just right? And how many of you don't think at all? It's usually a pretty good number in that crowd, isn't it? and I'd have to count myself in there with them, I guess. You've got a Bible with you. Turn to the book of Exodus. We, um, we've been talking about uh, revival and readying for revival for some time now. We've been uh, on this subject for several weeks, and we're looking forward to uh, seeing what the Lord's going to do tonight, and uh, this will be, well, it won't be the last service we have together, it'll be the last Sunday service we have together before our uh, revival begins next week. I want you to be praying about that every day. There's a sign-up sheet out in the vestibule. We're looking for 24 hours of uh, prayer here at the church, uh, the Saturday and, and uh, Saturday night leading up to Sunday morning of revival beginning Saturday morning at 7 a.m. and going through Sunday morning at 7 a.m. As it stands right now, I believe I've got to pray 12 hours during that time. So I need you all to sign up for something on there so maybe I won't have to be here the whole uh, 12 hours. So if it, before you leave, maybe sign up and take an hour. Uh, we would greatly appreciate that as we just pour out our hearts to God and look forward to revival, looking forward to this uh, uh, time of fasting that we've set aside uh, for the church to, uh, to reach God, to, to uh, pour out our heart to God and look for God's moving, look for God's mercy. And uh, I know that sometimes maybe it's hard to give up things, no matter what you may have decided to give up. And many of you may have decided to give up food uh, completely for a period of time, in just a few days, is uh, uh, that is attainable if you're in reasonably good health, and uh, we'll depend upon the Lord to help us during that time and give us the strength that we need. But whatever you've given up, give that time, just uh, devote that to the Lord and pray and ask God to help and give strength, and we pray uh, for the moving of God. And I believe when we pray together, I believe when we get together, I think God hears us in heaven. I believe that God's going to listen and I'm looking forward to a, a great time of revival. I believe that I'm going to experience revival. I don't know if you are, but I, I'm looking for it, and I pray that you will too. And I, I talked to Brother Randy for a little while yesterday uh, on the phone. He said, he, he said, Brother Stephen, he said, me and Kathy's been praying about this revival. He said, he said I've had other people pray, and he said, I want you to know. He said, man, he said, I'm excited. He said, I really feel good about what God's going to do. He said, I can't wait to see what he's going to do. I'm looking forward to this week. So you pray uh, for Brother Randy and Miss Kathy for their safe passage up and uh, also that God would use him in a mighty way. I want to share with you maybe uh, just uh, kind of hit the highlights of what we've been talking about, getting ready or readying for revival. We've talked about how that we need to get distressed. The Bible says rivers of waters run down mine eyes because, uh, because they keep not thy law. We need to get distressed with what's going on around us and look to the Lord. We need to develop a desire uh, to see revival. Psalm 85 says, thou, uh, Wilt thou not revive us again? I think that's the, the question that needs to be on our lips. And I believe the answer from God is certainly God will send revival. I, I think when we uh, really desire that, I think God will send it. We talked about needing discernment, how that we should read the Scriptures and live accordingly. We talked about revival being a personal decision that each of us would need to make, that, uh, that we were going to be, that we are going to be involved. It's a very 
personal thing. I, I can't give you revival. I can't set revival for you. I have set this time and prayed over who uh, may come, but uh, I can't bring you revival. Brother Randy can't bring you revival. God's the only one that can deliver revival, and you have got to want that on a personal level. It's a decision. Now, uh, we talked about the last few times we've been together, we talked about uh, devotion. We talked about uh, fasting. We're going through a time of fasting beginning tonight, going through Wednesday morning, crying out uh, to God, looking forward uh, to what He may do, denying ourselves, and just depending on God. And I believe that we'll see the power of God manifest Himself in our lives. We'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll praise Him, I believe, as an end result. We talked about prayer. Uh, we talked about how that David said, For my love, they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. We have a lot of enemies around. We have a lot of enemies without and within, but we give ourselves unto prayer. We make our prayer, as Nehemiah said, unto God. We depend upon God. We talked about this morning, holy living. You remember talking about that over um, in, in uh, uh, Proverbs chapter number 4. Remember we read those scriptures and we talked about how that we need to protect our heart. Verse 23 said, keep thy heart with all diligence. Keep thy heart. We need to put a guard about our heart. We need to, there, there's, we need to realize there's dangers out there, right? We know that Satan goeth about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We know that we wrestle not against uh, uh, flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, right? Spiritual wickedness in high places. We know that Satan is battling against God's people. He, he certainly is a defeated foe, right? I've read the end of the book. I don't know about you, uh, but I know that he's a defeated foe, but he's certainly going to use what time that he has left to try to thwart any work that God is going uh, to do through his people. And I think sometimes we just leave ourselves wide open for a spiritual attack because we're not guarding, because we're not keeping, because we're not protecting our hearts. We leave ourselves wide open to spiritual attack. And I tell you, friend, when we're caught up in the things of the world, when we're wound up in ourselves, and we leave ourselves open to spiritual attack, we know that we'll not be any good for the cause of Christ. We'll not be used. I tell you, we ought to play, we ought to stay as close to God as we can get so our witness has power. We ought to put anything that might even be perceived as wrong away from us because we don't want to destroy our witness. That's the most powerful thing that we have. We're going through this reality checkpoint and, 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 and doing the practice each week and, and making some changes. And I, I told Brother Anthony today, I kind of joked with him a little bit, uh, there he's going to be preaching a funeral scene. And then once the crowd leaves there, they're going directly to the hell room. I said, y'all really need to pray for Brother Anthony because he's the last man they're going to see and the whole crowds are going to hell. So y'all cry, y'all pray for Brother Anthony uh, that as he preached. But pray for the whole, you pray for the whole thing. I tell you, we really need to reach people for Christ. We need to try uh, our, our level best. We need to try new means. We need to try every means possible to reach people for Jesus, right? That's what we need to do. But if we don't live a holy life, our words will have very little effect on anybody else. They probably won't listen if we're not living what we say uh, that we're preaching. So uh, we talked about that. We talked about uh, how that we should uh, how, live a holy life. Now, tonight we're going to talk about uh, the last thing. We've talked about distress, desire, discernment, uh, our, our decision, devotion, and now, lastly tonight, and not least of all, we're going to talk about dependence. We have got to depend upon the Lord. If we're going to see revival, it's got to be God that does that. We've got to want it, but only God can bring revival. Now, you found uh, Exodus. I don't know if I've already told you that. Uh, but chapter uh, 33, beginning in verse number 12 tonight. Exodus 33, 12. When you found that, if you're able, you can stand to your feet as we honor the reading of God's Word this evening. 
Verse number 12. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Father, it is good to be here tonight. We thank you for this good crowd that's been able to come. Thank you for the good crowd that we had this morning. Lord, we're looking forward to a revival meeting. God, we got a good preacher coming. Lord, we got a good group of people that love you and want to work for you. Lord, I don't see anything now that stands between us and revival, Lord, but a touch from you. God, help us to realize tonight how dependent we are upon you. Lord, I've got a scripture tonight that you've given me, and I've got some words I've prepared to say, but Lord, I know if you don't lead me to say any of them, God, you're going to work, because we've already read your word. Clear out our hearts anything that doesn't belong. Father, I pray that you'd speak loud and clear that we'd make up our mind that we're just going to listen to you. God, that we're just going to do whatever you might say to us. Be with those over with Brother Tyler and the youth. I pray you'd open those kids' hearts. God, I thank you for what I see you doing in their lives, and I pray that you'd bless Brother Tyler, provide for him, protect him as he gets his education, help him and prosper him as he teaches the word, and God, I pray you'd use him in a mighty way. Grow that group, God. Uh, grow this group. Father, help us to grow closer to you, not only, uh, Lord, to grow numerically, but to grow spiritually as well. Have your will and way. And Lord, I pray that we'd be ready for revival. Lord, as we began our fast tonight, I pray that you'd give us strength, give you people strength, and I pray, God, that we'd cry out unto you and that you would hear us in heaven, God, that you would answer our, our prayers. God, we pray for this 24 hours of prayer that you'd get everybody involved that needs to be. God, burden the hearts of the people to, to pray together, to pour out our hearts unto you. I believe that you want to help us now. Manifest yourself in such a way that it'd be obvious that you meant here with us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And all the church said, Amen. You may be seated. I'm not going to keep you a long time tonight. I'm going to share three truths with you from this scripture, and then I'm going to let you go. We're talking about tonight being dependent, being dependent upon the Lord. Now, how many of you, you, you studied probably somewhat the life of Moses. You know about Moses. You, you've read a good deal of scripture. He's one of the most... Uh, uh, Godless men in the Bible. In fact, uh, the Bible says he's the meekest man that ever lived. We know that Moses was a good man. He was a godly man. He loved the Lord. And certainly he was used of God in a mighty way. And he left a great legacy of faith behind. Now, as we look at where he's at in this life, draw some truths out of where he and the Israelites out that we might apply them to our lives. Now, we must be like Moses and number one, be dependent upon the power of God. We must depend upon the power of God. I can't bring revival. If I could, we'd already had it. If I could just say, Lord, there's going to be revival here today, it would have already taken place. If I could touch folks and save them or draw them closer to the Lord, I would have done that. But we need God to do what only God can do. Now, 
as we look at where the Israelites at at the time that we're, we're at, at the time that we're speaking of, we know that they have been handed uh, kind of an impossible mission. When I say impossible mission, I believe or I mean that it was impossible in the eyes of man to do what God had called them to do. Now, one thing that we need to consider, oftentimes when God calls a man to do something, it seems impossible in that man's eyes that he'd ever be able to get it done. In fact, Henry Blackaby, I told you this many times, he said, I found out early in my ministry, if I could figure out how to do it, he said it probably wasn't God, but he said, when, when, when I could see no way that we could ever do it, he said, that's when it seemed that God was really in it. God wants us to try work that only God can do. And I'm glad to be serving in a place where the people believe that God God can still do a mighty work and are dependent upon God to do that work. That's what Moses is doing. Now, if you go back and look at verses 1 and 2, we find there that it said, The Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence and go to the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt unto the land which I swear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying unto thy seed will I give it. And he said, I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusites, all them sites. God's going to, they must have been a site, wasn't they? But uh, God, God's going to drive them out, right? And, and he, said, I'll send, uh, he said, I'll send my angel before you. But it's not talking about Jesus, he's talking about an unnamed angel there. And if you read a little bit closer, you'll find that God is displeased with the Israelites. That's why he's saying, he said, he, he said I'm not going with you, basically, but he said, I'll send an angel. And, he, he, and basically, the reason he said that is to let us know that it's an impossible task. There's no way that they could drive out all these people, such a sight of people. There's no way that he could drive them all, that they could drive them all out so the task is impossible now I, I, I don't I don't know about you but I think about biblically when I think about impossible tasks I think about Gideon you ever think about him God called him uh, to, to stand up and and and, and God told him uh, God told him to move and he didn't give him a very large number of people to do that with in fact if you if you'll go back to the book of judges in chapter number 7 you can read how that God whittled down his army to 300 men that he used to subdue his enemies now uh, we know that God God's not limited to numbers did you know that God is not limited by numbers. It doesn't matter if we're a small assembly. There was 100 people here in Sunday school this morning. That's a pretty good number for a country church. But And we had an even better crowd in worship service. And that's great. But God is not limited by number. If God wants to do a mighty work in and through this church, God will do it whether there are 100 or 300 or whether there's a dozen if we'll be faithful and depend upon Him to, to, to get the results. So that's what's happening here. They've been called to do something that only God can do. It was an impossible mission, so to speak. Now, you and I have an impossible mission as well. If we turn and look at Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said, because all power is given to me in heaven and earth, he said, go you therefore and make disciples. Now, we're supposed to go into all the world and make disciples. Uh, disciples. We're, uh, the Bible says we're supposed to, uh, to teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Right? So Christ has given us an impossible task. How could we ever reach the world? How could this church really effectively reach the world? Well, there's no way that we can do that in our power. It must take God to do that. You and I is going to have to depend on God and do what we can and pray that God will bless the work, right? There's no way that we can do that with a hundred people. We have to pray that God will do that. We have to realize that sometimes we're the vessel that God has chosen to reach. What God has called us to do God will empower us 
to do. So you see the impossibility of this mission. Also the inability, I believe, of their might. These people were, they weren't really trained for war. They weren't really warriors yet. They were going to have to go in and clear out the land. They couldn't possibly do that without God. Now, when I begin to think about that, I think back to 1 Samuel. And I think about another hero in the faith there. I think about David. You know, we talk about David, and uh, we, we mention him quite a lot uh, from the pulpit. And you probably think about him maybe from day to day, some of the things that he went through. But I think about the time when he was a little lad, and he went out. His father sent him out to see how his brethren fared. And, and, and when he went out there, uh, he, he saw his brethren. They, uh, they were getting ready to fight with the Philistines, and, and, and Goliath came out there, and he mocked. The Israelites, you remember that? And, and David was a young man, probably somewhere around 16, I believe, years of age at that time. And, and there was nobody that would go out to fight with Goliath. You remember that? But what did David say? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that doth defy the armies of the living God? He said, I'll go out to fight him. He said, I'll go out there. You think David was going out there to fight him in his might? You think David was going out there to fight him in his power? I believe David knew all along that God was going to be going with him. I, I believe that David was dependent upon God to go. I think he was a smart enough young man to know that he wasn't much of a match for a nine foot tall Philistine that had been fighting ever since he was a young man, an experienced man of war, a huge man of war, and this little ruddy, good looking young child. To go out there and fight him. He didn't even go out with a sword. The Bible says that he picked, he, he, he picked five smooth stones, right? And he went out there and he slung one of them with his sling and he let it go. And the stone sunk into his forehead and he hit the ground. David ran to the battle, slung the stone and took his head there on the ground. Because he believed in the Lord. Because he depended on upon the Lord. Many times we try to do things in our power, but David didn't do that. The Israelites, Moses certainly knew that they could never do that. If they were to go in and possess the land of Canaan, they needed God to do a miracle. Certainly they needed the presence of God. We can't win the world. David couldn't slay Goliath without him. The Israelites couldn't go in and take Canaan without him. You and I can't win the world without him. You and I can't have revival without him. We need God. We need to, to be dependent upon God. Verse number 16 says this. It says, For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. So you see, they were dependent, Moses was dependent on the power of God and also dependent upon the preservation of God. The preservation. He said, that we'll, we'll be separate. He said, For wherein shall we be here that I and my people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, he said, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Hey, listen, Moses knew. Moses knew that only God could forgive them for what they had done. If you back up and you read chapter number 32, you'll find there that the people had committed a great sin, right? If we go back to 32, it said when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mount, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said, Oh, make us gods which shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. And Aaron, Aaron uh, said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and the sons and daughters, and bring them to me. And what, what did Aaron do? It says in verse number for he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, and he said, or, or they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land. 
And when Aaron's son, he built an ark, he built an altar to it. So Aaron made a god, a false god there. The people had rebelled against God. They had turned their back on the Lord. And only God, they were dependent. Moses knew that only God could forgive them of that sin, right? We know when God told Moses, began to tell Moses what had happened. Moses came down from the mount and he went down there and he found that calf there. And, 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 and he said this, if you'll go through uh, uh, several verses in verse number 20 or verse number 19, it came to pass as soon as he came now to the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing in Moses' anger waxed hot and he cast the tables out of his hands and broke them beneath the mount and he took the calf which he made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and strewed it upon the water and made the children of Israel to drink. Then he said to Aaron, he said, uh, he said, what did this people to thee that thou hast so brought so great a sin upon them? And then Aaron said in verse 23, some of the most laughable words in the scripture. He said, he said, for they said unto me, Make us gods which shall be before us. For as for this Moses, he said, he said, We know what, what is become of them. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath he to go, let him break it off. So they gave it to me. And then I cast it into the fire. And there came out this calf. I still, it's hard for me to read that without laughing. I don't know. Maybe I've got the wrong sense of the word. But, but he, he says, hey, we throw this gold in there, and out came this calf. And we just worshiped it. And you see, he's led the people into idolatry. God was leading them away from idolatry. And he's leading them back into idolatry. You, it, what, a, what a terrible thing that it happened. Only God could forgive them. Verse number 16 said, Wherefore shall it be known that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Had God given grace to the Israelites? What is grace? Well, it's God's unmerited favor, right? And if you go all the way back to Abraham, the father of the faith, what does the Bible say that Abraham was? Was he a pretty good fella before he got with God? No. The Bible says he was over there worshiping idols just like everybody else was I don't know that he'd done anything. He couldn't have deserved God's favor. God just took him. God just called him out. God forgave him. And listen, if you're saved today, God called you out. God forgave you. I don't know why. I probably wouldn't have forgiven you. I probably wouldn't have forgiven me. I, don't, I didn't deserve it. It's hard to find forgiveness from man sometimes, but God's willing, isn't he? If we'll humble ourselves, God's willing. You see, he was dependent upon the preservation of God. Only God could forgive them. Only God could keep them. In verse number 16, he said, Is it not that thou goest with is, is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are on the face of the earth. God preserves his people in separating them, in keeping them. I believe that God keeps his people. I, I don't know about you. There are many today who say, well, this one or that one, they fell from grace. or they lost their salvation. I, I, I'm going to tell you something, friends. I don't believe that. I believe if I could keep it or if I, could, if I had to keep it, I wouldn't get out the door with it. Amen. Some of you know how forgetful I am. Some of you know uh, sometimes I, I'm, I'm pretty absent-minded. I wouldn't ever get out the door with it. I'm thankful today to know that the Lord is keeping me. You, you see, it'd be obvious to others uh, that, that God was with them. I tell you, we need to be dependent upon the Lord. We need to be dependent upon this Lord, uh, but upon the Lord. You remember when we talked about this morning the, the, the enemies that we face, right? And, and we know that there are dangers to our, to our heart. There are all types of enemies in the world, and there are, are dangers that we face every day. Well, if we're not dependent, if we don't have the presence of God, we have precious little protection. Then, then our lives probably won't hold up. But if we have the, the presence of God, if we're dependent upon the presence of God in our lives, listen, we can, we can endure anything. I, I brought these bottles with me. I, I did a, 
uh, a illustration one time for uh, I think maybe it was Bible school or Awana, uh, but I, I did an illustration, a very similar illustration. I, I've taken this glove and I've written enemy. I hope I spell it right. Uh, I've written enemy across that glove. If you didn't, you can blame my daughter because I asked her. But uh, and then, and then I, I wrote on this bottle, and these these are, are empty vessels, right? There's a difference, and you can see the difference in the two. Uh, this, this one here is, is without His presence, without God's presence. And, and this one here is who we are uh, with God's presence. We know that the enemy, we know that troubles and trials are going to come along in this life. And when the enemy uh, meets the, the believer that doesn't have the presence, is not full of the presence of God, we find that he's, he's crushed very easily. Uh, under the, uh, the weight of the world with, by his enemies. But when we got the presence of God, when we're dependent upon God and we, 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 we take the presence of God and we've got him dwelling with us, you, you see, I, I can hit this bottle and, and now I may wrinkle it a little bit. It might be crinkled, but, but the enemy's going to come and the, the, the bottle's just going to, it's just going to keep in shape. It's going to keep bouncing back. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but it makes a, a good deal of sense to me uh, that when I've got the Lord, when I, when I see the lid's on, the lid's on, I'm dependent upon God, right? Now you may not be able to see anything in there, but you know there's something in there. And I can't look at you and tell for sure. Now, sometimes I believe we see glimpses of God. But I think if you've got God in you, I think you're going to be all right. You see, we've got to be dependent. We, we've got to be dependent upon the Lord. Now, verse number 14 says not only are we dependent on the power of God and the preservation of God, but we're dependent upon the promise of God. The promise of God. Verse 14 said, and he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. So we know, we've shared this with you before, words written in italics in the King James English, they're added for our reading uh, ability to, to help us to, to help it to sound more clear. And he said, My presence shall go, and I will give thee rest. So what he's saying here, he's promising Moses. Moses has cried out, the people have sinned. The people have sinned. But Moses is interceding. In this situation, Moses is, is kind of a, a type of Christ. He's interceding for the people. I know that they've sinned, Lord. Extend your grace and mercy we deserve death and destruction, but send your grace and mercy. He said, Lord, he said, this angel can go. He, he said, but he said, if you don't go up, don't send me up either. If you don't go, God, he said, I, I don't want to go either. You, and, and I'll tell you, we, we don't want to be anywhere that God is not going you find here that he's dependent upon the promise of God and receives the promise of God. He said, I will go. He said, my presence shall go with thee. What did he mean by that? He said, he goes on to say, he says, I will give thee rest. And I thought about that. And to start with, I thought, well, maybe that means that in the midst of the trouble, in the midst of the trial, maybe that means that God will give you rest, that He'll be there with you, that He'll give you peace. In fact, that's what I started to go with there, but I'm not sure that's entirely correct, even though it could be true. God will give us peace in the hard times, in the trial and the tribulation. We know that God will give us peace, right? But I think the better sense of the word that He's saying, I will give you rest, God was promising the land. God, the land of rest. The place of rest. These people were looking forward to Canaan's land because it represented a place of rest. How about that? You and I, we're looking forward. We're looking forward to heaven. We're looking forward to a, to a place of rest. You know what? 
just as sure as God promised these Israelites Canaan and delivered it, God has promised you and I heaven. He's promised a believer heaven. And just as sure as He delivered it to the Israelites, God is going to deliver heaven to me and you. There's a place, Peter said, reserved in heaven that faith not away. He says, reserved for us. Them that name the name of Jesus. It's a literal place, sir. The Bible tells us in Revelation, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Now John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he'll dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Heaven is a, a literal place. It's a, it's a, it, listen, it's a promised place. It's a perfect place. It's a prepared place. Jesus said, I go prepare a place for you. And he said, if I go prepare a place for you, he said, I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Listen, we've got to be dependent upon God. When we're passing through this life, and that's all we're really doing is passing through. We're just pilgrims here in this earth, and we're looking for that city whose builder and maker is God. It's not building with hands, but the Lord is building us, making us a place. Are you dependent tonight? You'll never get revival. You'll never experience revival until you develop a dependence upon God. We've got to be dependent upon His power, His preservation, and also the promises that He gives us. I don't know about you, but sometimes that's the only thing that gives us strength for every day is looking forward to what heaven's going to be one day. That'll give you encouragement to go on every day. How about that? Father, it is good to be here tonight. We do thank you for this people, and we certainly thank you for your word. God, we're thankful tonight that you, Lord, you're trustworthy. You're faithful, and Lord, we can depend upon you. And God, I, you've given us a lot. You've given us abilities, talents. You've given us, Lord, privileges. You've given us, uh, Lord, you've given us treasures. But God, we can't accomplish anything of eternal value if you're not involved in it. So we depend upon you. We want to see your power. Help us to yield ourselves completely to you in Jesus' name. Stand to your feet. Miss Shirley's going to play. Do you need to come? Anyone need to be at the altar tonight? Preacher, I really want to see revival. Would you come to the altar and ask the Lord? I want to, ha I want to have revival myself. I can't speak for anybody else, but I want to see it. I, I believe God will bring revival. Do you depend upon Him? Any others need to make their way up tonight? You come if you can. If you're able welcome at the altar. Maybe it's time you need to pray. If you're here tonight and you're not sure that you know Jesus, would you come tonight, friend? Just say, preacher, I, I, need, I need to know more about this Jesus. I need to make sure I'm saved. I want to be ready for eternity. I want to look forward to heaven. Would you come?
Well, I appreciate you coming tonight. We hope you have a great week. Get it off on a good start this week. Be praying for the church. Pray for revival. Looking forward to the time of fasting starting tonight as we devote ourselves to God. Don't forget to sign up uh, for the uh, 24 hours of prayer on your way out the door tonight. Uh, we appreciate your presence very much. Let's see. Look at our day at on time. I do pretty good without a watch. I tell you, I believe I preach.